Hello and welcome to week four of our Bible study in James called Being Wise When Scattered. I'm so glad you've joined me again today. We are actually in chapter four and we have about three weeks of the study left. So it's just exciting to be exploring this important letter coming from the brother of Jesus to um, the church after it had been scattered from Jerusalem because of persecution. As James hears about uh, his friends, his beloved congregants, um, and begins to hear things that are happening in the community, he writes this letter longing for the community to have a new level of wisdom for the challenges that it is facing. It's been a rich study for me. So what I'd like to do is to go straight to our screen share and uh, get us going on the study for this week. So here we are in uh, James 4. Last week, uh, we discovered that the community that James is writing to had a teacher slash leader problem. There seemed to be uh, a group of teachers and leaders who were causing dissension. They were using their tongues, their gifts of communication to create conflict and dispute. They were showing partiality to, to the rich and dismissing the poor. It sounds like their tongues were out of control and were being used as tools for their selfish ambition and their bitter envy or zeal. These teachers seemed to lack true wisdom and instead had this earthly, fake, uh, faux wisdom of this kind of dog-eat-dog -dog world full of anger and jealousy. They seem to be leading the whole community into um, a community becoming increasingly disconnected from the teachings of Jesus. Um, we were left with a beautiful description of true wisdom being uh, peaceable and pure and gentle and willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits, no trace of partiality or hypocrisy. I know that this, these particular two verses, I have actually been praying repeatedly in several situations that I've been in. I keep asking God to give me and the leaders in our churches, in our state, in our nation, in our world, this heavenly, wisdom, this supernatural wisdom that can help guide us to peace. Um, being scattered demands a deeper, more Christ-like wisdom than perhaps ever before. We are moving on to chapter four, and in this chapter, James is going to connect the dots for these leaders and teachers in the community they do have a journey ahead, but it is not to climb the ladder of ambition and envy. James is going to show them what they have become and then call them to become something different. And I think it provides us with a wonderful warning and powerful invitation to us all. So let's go ahead and get started by looking at James 4, and we'll start with just those first three verses. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it. So you commit murder and you covet something and cannot obtain it. So you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. So I want you to notice that James points to the truth that inner turmoil leads to outer 
conflict. It's an important principle to remember. When we are under stress and full of fear or full of some of these things that these leaders in the community seem to be contending with, what is inside of us inevitably spills out. And most often it spills out into our relationships and affects how we live together. James is connecting this selfish ambition and bitter envy or zeal to the conflicts that are arising in the community. And he calls the source of these, of bitter zeal, envy, ambition, cravings. Another translation for that would be desires. And I think it's worth taking a moment to look at how desires are viewed in James's culture. American culture seems to exalt desires as one of the chief ways we are to live our lives. Uh, their desire is supposed to guide you. It's supposed to be your guiding star in your meeting. And, and if you're denying desire, it's going to be a negative thing. Um, pursuing our desires is kind of the American way. And the ancient world saw desires very differently. The Greek word that's being used here is hedoni. It is the word that serves as the root word for hedonism, that all out pursuit of pleasure. Hedoni is explored extensively in Jewish literature. The effects of it on a life are significant. It is said to produce boastfulness, covetousness, thirst for honor, rivalry, malice, gluttony, and an overall life posture of devouring anything and everything in order to gain pleasure. Really, Hedoni reduces the entire complex and beauty of the human person to just being a consumer. The same word is used in 1 Peter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desire, which desires which war against your soul. Here, these desires are pictured as destructive to the very core of our being, our soul. They are uh, they come and destroy our peace, right? They create war within us and they destroy our own connectedness between God and between us and our best selves, our true selves. Hedoni are highly suspect. But I do want to say there are positive desires. They are described as the desire for God, which uses the same word. Um, but it calls for discernment. You know, those desires aren't automatically good. And in fact, honestly, in the ancient world and in most of Jewish literature, they're viewed negatively. But whenever a desire arises, it needs to be discerned. It isn't automatically a guiding light in our lives. These leaders so desired power and prestige um, that they, as these teachers and leaders, are willing to sacrifice the peace of the community for the sake of them gaining what they want. The dissension and factions in the community begin with these leaders whose desires lead them to violence in word and possibly, indeed, it would appear, the reference to murder here in verse two could be about physical violence. Remember, we've talked about this zealotry uh, vein that certainly ran in the early church, but it also could be about envy and anger, which if you remember, counts as murder in your heart, according to the teachings of Jesus. And as we know, James is just so imbued in the teachings of Jesus that these constantly are emerging for him. Remember that throughout scripture, envy ever since the ancient story of Cain and Abel 
often leads to murder. So whenever you see murder, often envy is a part of the formula. These teachers are told that they don't have because they don't ask. They're meant, actually, if we go all the way back to James 1, verses 5 and 6, they're instructed to ask for wisdom and it will be given them. And again, as a teacher, as a leader, there should be nothing that we desire more than wisdom as we carry out our calling and our duties and our life in the community. These leaders, however, are not asking um, for wisdom. Uh, they actually think they already have it. Now, when these leaders do ask for whatever they're asking for, they are prayers of selfish ambition and of envy. These are wasted prayers that are spent on the realm of their own pleasures. They are unanswered prayers because God is merciful and does not always hand us over to our darkest desires and impulses. Their corrupt motives undo their prayers. Faithfulness and obedience in the Old Testament are the conditions for answered prayer. One cannot pray rightly with a heart so choked with evil as these leaders and these teachers have. These leaders seem to have lost sight of the difference between what they want and what God wants. And James goes on to nail them. Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is for nothing that the scripture said, God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? but he gives all the more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yeah, you can feel the shock of that first word. Now, instead of calling them brothers and sisters, he calls them adulterers. It's a shocking address for these leaders who would see themselves as rightfully leading the community to faithfulness in God and probably doing it better than any of the other teachers or leaders. James is actually using Old Testament prophetic imagery here. Uh, in the Old Testament, God is pictured as married to Israel, but Israel has committed adultery by worshiping other gods. Um, if you have an Old Testament-shaped mind, like James would and, and, and these early Christians would, the question the reader asks is, what are these leaders worshiping? What has taken the place of God? Maybe power and prestige are possibilities as we reflect on the book of James uh, thus far. Here, though, what's interesting is James does turn that image, that Old Testament image, a little bit. He uses the term of friendship rather than marriage. And I want to just pause here, too, to just explore a little bit of what friendship in the Old Testament and in the ancient world was. Friendship was a relationship of deep commitment. It had profound consequences on life. Friendship was considered the most pure relationship, the most intimate relationship, and really the best relationship you could have. It was regarded far above romantic love. It involved a careful selection process that only a few people would be chosen as friends for the wise person. This relationship would shape um, each person morally, so that the friends you chose shaped your soul. It would take sacrifice and great faithfulness and loyalty to be a friend. 
The question is, why did James choose this friendship rather than marriage? James might have chosen this image because these leaders weren't all out worshiping other gods. They really aren't preaching another gospel, right? There isn't heresy being preached here, but they have made friends with the world system that teaches that glory and power are the things to be sought after. It's this system that they have befriended that says the path of pride is the way to happiness. There is a harsh contrast here where these leaders who should be the best friends of God have become the enemies of God as they no longer offer the wisdom from above to the people who most desperately need it now. Verse five is a strange verse and it's much contested in scholarship. And I actually think after studying that the NRSV translation, which is the one we're using, is a really good one. The jealousy of God is for connection to the spirit he has placed in us. This is both our spirits as well as the Holy Spirit. We are meant to be united to God. His spirit friends us. The spirit binds us. And anything that would unbind us is wrong. It is devastating to our souls because they are regenerated by that very spirit. So if the friending of the world is actually the undoing of the source of our life to our souls, we must turn from this path. It is going to lead to destruction. After using this kind of sharp language of adultery and enemy, to warn these teachers of the path they're on, he does let them know that grace can triumph over their corruption right now. God wants them to return from this path of selfish ambition and bitter zeal and to return to him. His grace is sufficient for their sinful souls. It is an abundant grace that he is giving even more generously in this time of being scattered. Pride has made them enemies of God as he opposed, as they um, oppose, uh, sorry, pride has made them enemies of God as God himself opposes the proud, right? That God sets himself against the proud. And the invitation is to become humble because God counts the humble as his friends. And there you see that grace word again, that this humility becomes the avenue into uh, God's grace. God's grace can triumph over their arrogance. God's grace can supplant that deadly duo of arrogance arrogance, as well as wrong desires that seem to have taken hold in their lives. God wants to give them something so much better than this. And that's where we come to in verses 7 through 10. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify you, your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into dejection. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Now, I want to say that this little section is one of the most strident calls for repentance in the whole New Testament. James is desperate for these leaders and the community that is following them to repent and to turn from the path that they are on. The grace-filled path for these pride-twisted leaders is in submitting themselves to God 
they have to dethrone their own desires and enthrone God. And as you can see in this list of commands, this is an intense process. They need to resist the devil. This is military language, and it evokes this cosmological battle going on between good and evil. What's really interesting here is James is wanting them to turn their fight in the right direction. They are fighting the wrong enemy. They're fighting one another, and they're vying with one another for uh, you know, honor or glory or whatever. And he's like, you're fighting the wrong enemy. Resist the devil. Uh, he is the one that is going to destroy you. And if you will resist him, he will flee. They are told to draw near to God. And this is a very Jewish concept. The people uh, of God draw near to God, especially in the Old Testament, in order to hear from God or to reestablish the covenant relationship with God or to turn from sin. This is actually the perpetual call of the prophets to draw near to God. So you are hearing James standing up in this full uh, tradition of an Old Testament prophet here. God has one response to his people when they draw near to him. He covers the distance they cannot go, and he draws near to them. He draws near to us. Next comes cleansing imagery. And it's used, uh, when it's used, it evokes these ritual washings that the Jewish people were commended to do. Washing your hands and purifying your hearts is a whole person cleansing. We wash away the things that are leading us to death, like envy and arrogance and ambition by purifying our hearts. And we wash our hands or our way of living in the world. Our hands are always this work in the world imagery that we're doing. He calls them to a cleansing kind of repentance that includes lament and mourning and weeping. He tells them to let go of the laughter and joy of serving themselves and leading people away from God because there is a temporary hit to your ego. There is a kind of pleasure of climbing a ladder and gaining recognition. Um, but they must let go of that in order to embrace the true path of service to God. It is a costly repentance, a true grief that cleanses away the cravings that they are living according to right now. Remember that word lament is used when someone's future prospects are awful and inescapable. So you lament when you realize that what lies ahead feels so bleak and so awful and so terrible. And mourning is uh, what one does when one has lost something precious or something that you counted a treasure. So these leaders and the people who have followed them are being called to lament the path that they have set themselves on, which sets them in direct opposition to God. And they are to mourn um, the loss of what they have treasured, this ambition and uh, envious gaining of status in their culture. I want you to notice James here, um, again, the teachings of Jesus absolutely hang and haunt in James. Um, here, Jesus' parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, which is found in Luke 18. Um, they, it is echoed here, the, the tax collector, if you remember, and the Pharisee are praying in the temple, and one exalts himself and one humbles himself, and it's surprising because it's the Pharisee, this honored person, 
is the one who exalts himself and the tax collector is the one who humbles himself. And Jesus says it's the tax collector that is shown to be more righteous. And it's really Luke 18, 14 that says, anyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. You can hear that here uh, echoing in James's call. He promises them that God will exalt them. This exaltation will look different than the selfish ambition kind of exalting. This exaltation will be the ability to live at peace in a community that is thriving. It'll be the ability to show compassion to the needy. It'll be the ability to control your tongue and the ability to love your neighbor and the ability to lead God's people in the path that God desires his people to be on. And James finishes up this call to repentance and new life in the final two verses we'll be looking at today. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers and sisters. Whoever speaks evil against another or judges another speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? Here, James really summarizes again the call to these leaders they're to stop speaking evil of each other and to, and to stop taking the place of God in their judgments against each other. There is one lawgiver and one judge, and they are to submit to him. James seems to place their acts of judgment against other brothers and sisters in a larger context. These acts of judgment are actually judging the law, he says. Interesting. The law that it is probably talking about is likely that royal law of loving one another. The law is clear about not speaking evil to each other or slandering each other. That's in Leviticus. It is unloving to use language, which is meant to connect us and, to, and not to harm and shame people. So when you choose to use language, to hurt and to harm, you're actually judging the law as being wrong. And in the end, if you judge the law, then you actually stand in judgment of the lawgiver, which is a fearful place. James ends here really with a final call to humility as we speak to and of one another. I think this is an important in this time um, to really heed these words. It's funny how easy it is to judge the motives and the actions of others. And I think even the fact that we are physically separated from each other, we're not meeting with each other face to face. We're just voices or images on a screen. It just seems easier to assume the worst of each other. And James is cautioning us to love each other even more deeply when we find ourselves in vulnerable and judgeable places. I think his overall call to humility and repentance for the sake of peace has just been echoing in my own heart. Humility to recognize when I'm being judgmental and arrogant or envious in these strange and stripping times. I know that I want to be quick to repent and tender-hearted and full of tears for when I have harmed others or disparaged others. And I have to say I am grateful that Jesus is my savior. And as James says, from our scripture today, he gives all the more grace during these times. Let's pray. Lord God, 
just want to thank you for repentance, for the ability to turn away from destructive paths, destructive habits, things, Lord God, that ruin us, that come between um, ourselves and you, that set us in opposition to your kingdom, which is coming. Lord God, for me and for my friends today, would you give us wise, wise hearts that we might know where the call of repentance is for us. Bless us with the grace of humility so that we can move ahead loving you, friends of you, deeply connected to your will in your work in this season. Do it, Lord, for your glory, and in your name we pray. Amen. Here are uh, the questions for discussion. If you would like to do them, uh, you can just kind of pause the video here, and if you want to journal or talk to someone, those are available for you. Um, I just want to thank you so much for joining me. I am so grateful for your presence. And again, this study of James has just been so rich. Thanks for being part of my community during this season. Blessings to you, and we will see you next.